Hello, welcome to jasonnewland.com. My name is Jason Newland. This is relaxation hypnosis for stress, anxiety and panic attacks. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. And although this recording isn't necessarily to help people to sleep, it's just good to make sure that you are safe to close your eyes in case you do fall asleep because (laughs) I've got a very boring voice and uh, also I do a lot of sleep recordings I've got podcasts for um, deep sleep whisper hypnosis let me bore you to sleep uh, sleep hypnosis weekly so probably 80% 80% of what I do is sleepy stuff. So I think my voice is kind of perhaps suited to that. However, I also do this. I also do chronic pain relief uh, and other like self-development, self-help recordings as well. And some stop smoking ones. I've got lots of different things. Now before I start, I'd like to give a big shout out to um, two people, I think. Let me just say, yeah, two people. Firstly, Vicky, who sent me uh, an email, and it's on the review page of my website. Uh, hi Jason, I've been listening to your Spotify. Listen to, always read it wrong. Hi Jason, I've been listening to you on Spotify since I had a stroke in July 2019, age 34, which has uh, left me partially sighted with severe anxiety and depression. And I find your podcasts really helpful. So thank you, Vicky. And I got left a video review from Boston Chicky, which you can also view on my review page of my website. Uh, Saying thank you, and she listens to these podcasts, and she's been listening from the start, actually, from the not only from the the start of when I very first started making this podcast back in, I think it was the beginning of two thousand seventeen might have even been 2016 but I think it was 2017 where I did 34 recordings I think I did them every day for 34 days and then I stopped and then I picked them up again last year and now I've got this is the 81st recording so um, so I'd just like to say thank you to Boston Chicky she mentioned some stuff on there about getting in touch with, you know, remembering that you've helped people. And also, she reminded me that I've also helped people, which is nice to hear as well. So, thank you for that. What I'd like to talk about, and also leave a review if you, if you like what I do, it rhymes. And uh, Andre just appeared. He likes to do that when I start a recording. He likes doesn't like to be left out. I like to talk about purpose. Purpose. Uh, I watched a video earlier, uh, and it was about procrastination. And it was I think it's Russell Brand. And he was saying, uh, talking about um, procrastination can be caused or is caused by not having a purpose. Or being lazy can be caused by not having a purpose. And it didn't sit too well with me, if I'm honest. I think if you're not ever doing anything then that's probably caused by depression and it could definitely you know be caused by not having a purpose 
or not being in touch with that purpose or not more importantly not remembering what the purpose is because that can be something that may be necessary is not just to have a purpose but to remember it every day to have it with you wherever you go almost like a mole on your chin you know you take it everywhere you go or your favourite hat or your glasses if you need glasses make sure you take that purpose with you and this isn't um, this isn't even a suggestion this is a must this is a definite necessity that all of us keep in mind and keep hold of that purpose that we have in life the reason the big thing that we get up for and I know some people they lose track of that purpose sometimes they feel that they don't have a purpose at all or maybe the purpose they used to have has come to an end for whatever reason so for someone maybe the whole purpose of their existence may have been connected to raising a family and maybe now the family's left they've gone all gone to college or now they're married and or maybe they've you know the relationship split up their purpose may have been might have been to support their partner or their purpose may have been connected to their job but now the job's gone for whatever reason or they've retired so there's so many ways that a purpose can change or possibly dissolve because it's no longer relevant so in that situation and I have dealt with people in the past clients in counselling when I was a counsellor who didn't feel that they had any purpose and that's one of the worrying things with things like suicide I don't think I mean, it's, I'm generalising here but I very much doubt that anyone would kill themselves if they felt that they had a really important purpose in their life or they felt that, thought that their felt that their life was purposeful regardless how bad things got they'd stick around as long as they could even through ill health again that is a generalization because each individual situation is you know different but the amount of people I've heard in the past tell me there's no point to anything there's no reason for them to be here which means they have no purpose they don't feel that there's a purpose to their life or that there's a purpose to them or that they're important or that they mean anything or that life has any meaning which is the main thing is it the word meaning purpose sometimes feels a bit like something you do like I purposely do this thing meaning is it's deeper it feels almost deeper for something to actually have meaning true meaning to you so that's another must we must have meaning in our lives we have to there's no option other than to have that we need to have that it's just as important as eating, breathing, drinking water, you know, those things that we have to do. Some people might say, well, I never drink water, I always drink squash and milk and juice, I don't care, just, you have to drink something, don't you? We have to have meaning and purpose, and I class those two as, as the same 
purpose and meaning. I'm going to use that as the same word. Meaning the same thing. So these are things that we have to have. And it's not me telling you you have to have it. It's me just pointing out that we all have to have it in order to survive, in order to live a life which, well, maybe also to make sense of things that, or at least accept things that don't make sense, but accept that that's part of being human. You know, kind of moving onwards, moving forwards. Because that's all we can ever do. You can't go backwards. It's impossible. I read something earlier. Um, that's it, Andre. Run around in a plastic bag. That's good. Good boy. While I'm making a recording. I read something earlier which said... Um, Today is the tomorrow that you were worrying about yesterday. Today is the tomorrow that you were worrying about yesterday. And worrying about today, yesterday, which would be your tomorrow, hasn't helped today at all. Being concerned about it, making arrangements and necessary changes necessary can be useful but worrying isn't useful so going back to this this like idea of procrastination, if I can say the word. The idea that procrastination means that someone's got no purpose or meaning to their life, I think is actually wrong. It's quite a horrible thing to say, really. It just means that in that moment, and that moment may last a few weeks or a few months even, but in that moment of their life, they're not maybe in touch with the meaning of their life. So the question could be, how do you get in touch with the meaning of your life? And I would suggest maybe having more than one meaning. Instead of putting all your meaning into just one thing. For someone that says, oh, my purpose in life is to be a parent. My meaning is to be a parent. That what gives my, that's what gives my life meaning. Brilliant, but it needs to be more than that for you. Because your children are never going to appreciate what you've done. It's never going to happen. They're not going to know what you've done, what you've sacrificed to bring the children into the world and to to raise them. Just like we are never going to, adults who are adults now, are never really going to appreciate what our parents maybe did. Those that had, you know, nice parents. So, what meaning can you give to your life that's for you? just for you you alone it's not connected to anybody else and it's not about giving up the meaning that you already have the you know the motivation that you already have to get out of bed because you know if you're if your motivation to go into work is because you want to Make sure that your teenage daughter or son has enough money to go to college. 
when they're, you know, in a couple of years' time. Yet yeah, you've got a, you sit in there at breakfast and your teenage child is being an utter arsehole, which teenagers do have a tendency to be. It's part of, they're supposed to be like that. Being a real, <laughs> uh, not very communicative. And you're driving to work thinking, what's the point of me doing this, working all these hours? <laughs> he or she doesn't even respect what I do doesn't appreciate what I do so that's him putting that meaning of your life categorising it and putting it into someone else's or someone else's shoulders almost blaming someone else for your choices so you need to be able to have that you know be going to work for yourself as well and that's, maybe some people think that's selfish. Or oh, we shouldn't be thinking of ourselves. We should only think of our daughter. We should only think of our parents. We should only think of the mortgage we've got to pay. Or I should only that, you know, whatever. Is that realistic though? Is it healthy? Because ultimately you're going to be with yourself. And you have been with yourself and you will be with yourself every second of every every second of your life you have been with you and you're the only person that's done that no one else has been with you the whole of your life you have no one else knows what you think except you you're the only one that knows the thoughts in your mind you're the only one that really knows what you like and what you want and what you would like to do. I mean, deep down. I mean, you may share a lot of this stuff uh, with friends, family, but you're the only one that really knows you in that way. You know, it's and it's not about, oh, that we're being false so other people can't get to know us. It's not that. It's just, there's a level, isn't there? There's a level that we know ourselves that other people won't know. There's times when perhaps we feel crappy, but we tell the person we're with that we feel fine because we want them to have a good time and we know that they're going through a difficult time. We want, we want them to feel good. Or someone buys you a present that you don't particularly like. And you say, oh, it's lovely, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, thank you for that hat doesn't fit on my head a big woolly hat that's going to go really great with a suit for work thank you lovely uh, you know it could be my nan used to give me socks for Christmas when I was younger and she said actually she used to she used to knit these jumpers where I couldn't actually get my head through they were actually the, the neck width was actually the size of my neck it was the width of my neck. Once I got it over my head, not realising I wasn't going to be able to get it off, I had to cut the thing off or wear it for you know, the rest of the year, hoping that I didn't grow. So, but I'd never said anything. You know, I would never say, "Oh, look, what is this rubbish? What on it, Nan? What is this crap? Take it back. I want a bike. Give me a bicycle." Of course I wouldn't say that. But I might think it. And that's what's really happening, is what you're really thinking. Doesn't mean you're gonna say it. Doesn't mean it's necessarily true either. So it might just be anger. Oh, I wish wish that person would run away, I wish that person would do this. But you might not really wish it. You're just daydreaming or just you know thinking these things in anger or you might think oh he's nice or he's, he's so much he's much nicer than my husband but it might be a fantasy it doesn't mean you're going to leave your husband or anything but if you said it out loud to your husband it could cause problems possibly 
So we're the only ones that know what's going on in their mind, what's going on. I'm not going to use the word soul, but what's going going on in our hearts, what's going on in our body, how we physically feel, how we emotionally feel. We're the only ones that know that. And we can share it sometimes. Maybe we can share it a lot. You may have a relationship where you do share an awful lot of how you're feeling, but you can never share all of it because that would be a 24 hour conversation that would never end. It would be just constant. Which brings back, it turns it around with the anxiety part. If someone was telling you all their thoughts and verbalizing it to you, you would have to leave them. You would not be able to stay around them because it would be too much. If someone told you, no matter how much you cared for them, if they blurted out every single thing that they thought, I'm talking about every single thought, thousands and thousands and thousands of thoughts every day, I don't know how many there are, it would be overwhelming, it would be too much. It would be, it'd just be awful. Flip that on its side, on its back, on its tummy, tickle its tummy, and you get it back. And you say, well, actually, that is going on inside your head. But they're your own thoughts. So we're being bombarded 24 hours a day. I say 24 hours, we're asleep for maybe eight hours of those. As it may be. So let's say 16 hours a day, you've got these thoughts. Now, if that was another person, you would have to get away from them. You would need a break. Which means I think we possibly need a break from ourselves. We need to take a break from that thinking. And that's where these recordings come in. That's where meditation comes in. Relaxation techniques. Being able to just sit and let those thoughts just float away. Maybe having a long bath. Maybe eating a meal. Something that you really enjoy but you're focusing on the food and the taste of the food or maybe getting engrossed in a in a movie for an hour and a half or two hours where you're not thinking so going back to the that part that you need to look after yourself to have that meaning that's more than other people now I believe helping other people helps you I, I do I think it helping other people is the best thing in the world it's not necessarily the most important thing you know I do I do recognise that in a sense of I can help as many people as I can. I could have the I could have millions of people every day listening to me. But that's not gonna get me out you know, it's not gonna help me. Um it's not gonna cook my dinner. It's not gonna it's not gonna get me out of bed. I have to do that myself. It's not gonna get my me dressed. I have to do that myself. It's not gonna help me with my relationships with my family I have to put that effort in myself you know like we all do but helping others is I think it's the, the best one of the best things helping others helps you but the simple fact is why I mention at the end of every recording that you deserve to be happy. Remember to be kind to yourself. 
it's because you have helped other people. And I won't go into it, you know, on a big, a big thing about it, but it's true. So these are facts. I will, I will argue, I could argue for the rest of my life, and I will never back down on this. It's a fact. You, everyone listening to this, has helped other people. Not just people that you know about. Not just people that you're aware they've told you you've helped me. But also people that you've never met. Indirectly. People love to talk to each other about what someone else said. Sometimes, don't they? So you might have said something to a friend. You might have been talking on a bus. Someone behind you is listening. They hear it. They might think, what a load of crap, what are they talking about? Go home, talk to their partner, tell them what they heard. And their partner might think, wow, that's, that's, that makes some sense, that does. Because that person sitting behind you on the bus, I might be talking to my friends saying, you've helped people. Remember, you've helped people. You know, I might be, sometimes I do say this to people. And the person behind me thinks, what's he talking about? Goes home, tells his wife, uh, boy, you, you don't ever helped anyone, have you? This person was saying about buses, you don't, you've, or you, you know, and he might be having a go at her. Yeah, yeah, or it might be a woman having a go at her husband. You've never helped anyone. You just think of yourself the whole time, haven't you? And then she's in bed, or he's in bed, thinking, well, actually, I've helped a lot of people. And start to remember what they've done. And maybe start to have start to notice that sense of self-worth growing, blossoming, coming out from underneath its rock that it's been, you know, crushed by the person maybe that they've been living with, telling them that they're no good and they're this and that, putting them down. I'm not saying this to split people's relationships up, but if you're with someone that's uh, mentally or physically or emotionally abusing you that is not a relationship so there you go so this this that person could start thinking ah oh, and get in touch with that part of them that remembers remembers that actually you know what I've I have helped people remember when I called the ambulance Remember when I visited that person and you know in hospital and I, and my friend and there was a lady sitting on her own and I went over and spoke to her and she thanked me because no one had visited her because she's got no family. Well, she got family; they live a long way away, so she was on her, on her own and she was seeing all these other people coming in with their family members and she was felt really lonely, but she didn't want to. You know, didn't want to say anything. And maybe during that conversation, she said to you, oh, by the way, I don't feel very well. I've been having these pains. And, I said, and you say, what? So I've been having these pains in my chest, but I don't want to say anything to the nurses because I don't, you know, so busy. So you go over and get a nurse. You might not know what's happened after that, but you might have saved that lady's life. I mean, there's once, now I'm not blowing my own trumpet here. Um, I, I don't know why I did it, but it just came naturally to me. And I found it funny as well. Not, not the first bit that I'm about to tell you, but I was, this lady fell over. So that's not the funny part, obviously. And she, I think she broke her hip or her leg or something. Uh, I never found out really what happened to her afterwards, but she was lying on the floor and it was cold 
I think it was probably wet outside as well. This is winter time, not not full winter, but probably autumn. You know, it's pretty cold, windy. There's a lot of people about, a lot of people opposite Tesco supermarket, lots of people walking past. Not ignoring her, you know, but just looking at her because that's what you do. You look, don't you? And you walk on, which must be horrible if you're lying on the floor. I've never been in that situation before. But I can imagine it's quite anxiety provoking to be lying on the floor unable to move and be in the centre of attention and you really don't want to be. As well as being in pain and being... She was upset. She was shaking. She was, you know, it wasn't just the cold. It was... She was very, very quite traumatised. She had a husband with her. He had a walking stick. So he was with her. But he he basically was... He had to stand up. So a shop came that was near there came and gave her a uh, like a cushion to put under her head and put a blanket over her. So that was nice. But I was looking at the situation. I thought I walked up to say, "Are you all right?" And she said, "Do I look all right?" And I said, "No." And um, so I'm just like chatting, and I see that he's there, she's down there. And there's people just walking and they're staring at her. So what I do is I lay down on the ground with her. And it wasn't for um, attention. I wasn't taking notice of anyone else. I just laid down on the ground so that I could be next to her, like face her. Kind of. And I waited there till the ambulance got there. And it was really weird. It's just, and I was making her laugh. And I think she found it so ridiculous that I'd actually laid down on the ground with her. It tickled her. It really kind of made her laugh and her husband was laughing. No one was looking at her anymore. They were probably looking at me, wondering, well, probably looking, why is there two people lying on the floor? Get a room. And that felt like the right thing to do. So helping her helped me. Because I felt good afterwards. And you know, I'm no hero. I didn't do I didn't do any first aid. I didn't do anything really other than I distracted her from what she was feeling physically. I did a little bit of hypnotic kind of languagey stuff, but you know, not kind of obvious stuff, but I just kept her focused on me. And I felt I might have held her hand at one point and then her husband said, Oh, none of that. She's my wife. I said, okay, sorry. So I held his hand as well. We were all happy. We ended up, we ended up getting married. No. So I just looked after her and just sat down on the floor, lay down on the floor with her. And it was the most weirdest thing to do. But it felt like I was almost fitting in with who I am as a person, rather than trying to be something different. I actually did what was natural to me. Now, if I'd have walked on, and that was what was natural to me, then that's also fine. Because there was people there that would look after her. She didn't need me to look after her. There was plenty of people that could have, that would come, would, would come up and see if she was okay and stuff. And she got her husband there, and there's people in the shop. So she wasn't on her own on the floor. Well, she was, but, you know, before I laid down, but she wasn't alone, alone. I suppose that that's kind of comes together with purpose, with meaning. That felt meaningful to me because I was doing what comes naturally, like a natural meaning. Actually, gives that gave meaning to my day. 
I don't want that to happen every day. And I'm not relying on things like that to happen for me to have meaning in my life. I do this. This is what I do. I do these recordings. I've done it since 2006. And that's what gives me meaning. But I'm also, I'm Andre's daddy. Andre the ferret. That gives me purpose and meaning. I have to get out of bed every day to look after him. To give him food, to take him out. Give him cuddles, kisses, and you know, just to look, just to look after him. That gives me extra meaning, and in some way, the meaning I get from him possibly outweighs the meaning I get from doing this recordings, because there's that bond, that closeness, you know, physical closeness I got with him, and I love him so much. So having meaning doesn't necessarily have to have anything to do with helping other people. But I think it's good to get in touch with the fact, the fact, I'll say again, the fact that you, everyone listening to this, has helped lots of people in the past and will help many people in the future. Just a kind word or a smile can make the difference. For someone that feels invisible, maybe someone looks at them and says hello, or they, you know, maybe someone that's sitting on the street, they're homeless. You know what I noticed? I had this said to me, I had a, a bloke, I stopped, and he said, spare change, spare change. You know, standard kind of, uh, thing and I stopped and I said I've got no money well I said I've got money but I want to keep it I don't want to give it to you <laughs> I didn't say that I said I've got no money and he said don't worry I'm just he said I'm just happy you stopped I've been sitting there for five hours and not one person said hello spoken to me or even looked at me so even people that want money and they're they're Unless they're aggressively begging, then that could be off-putting and horrible, actually, for, for those involved. But people, I noticed, I didn't really thought about it before, even people that are, you know, begging on the streets, they don't just want money. I mean, they probably, they wouldn't, it won't be any good to them if they had the whole day of people stopping and chatting to them, because they also need money for whatever they need to pay for. But they also need that human contact, that little bit of um, humanity to remind them that they are human, that they are part of society, even though they don't feel it. And I can kind of relate to that, being with anxiety, stress, uh, mental health issues. Sometimes I felt like I'm completely outside of society I come on another planet sometimes and what's strange is because of the old uh, mental illness in a similar way to some physical illness like let's say fibromyalgia people can't see it so they can't see it and so they can't grasp it. I'm not talking to everybody. I mean, some people can't grasp um, what it is. You know, you look okay. And I've been told, I've even been told by psychiatrists. Um, this not recently, but back in when I lost my job and had a bit of a, I suppose maybe a breakdown. I don't know what you want to call it. Um, in 2013. And I had, I think I had three psychiatrists that I saw, and all of them were rude to me. One was rude without meaning to be. He said to me, "Oh, I saw you in the in the, ch the not the ch not the changing rooms, the waiting room. I thought you was uh, a doctor or something because you're wearing glasses. Didn't think you was a patient because you're smart." 
I said, okay. I don't want to break it to them. The reason I'm smart is because I'm wearing my work clothes because that's all the clothes I ever have is my trousers and my shirts from working in the office. I didn't really have any casual clothes. And when I go out, I still wear, short, I still wear sh- um, shoes and trousers. I haven't worn jeans for years. So like the idea that I look smart and I'm wearing glasses, therefore I must be mentally well. Now he wasn't rude of it, but at the same time, it's like, really? You're a professional, you're a doctor. You really, yeah. And another person, another doctor said that they thought, oh, you just, you might just be, she wouldn't give me psychotherapy. She refused to put me forward to psychotherapy saying that I might just be blagging it just to get benefits. So, you know, I wish I'd recorded this stuff. And uh, I had another one that was, I forget what he said, he was rude as well. It's like, now the ones I see are really good. But it's like, wow, if that's what the professionals are like, why would we expect someone that has no knowledge, no professional knowledge, no medical knowledge, to think any different? If that's what the professionals that are meant to know. I mean, a psychiatrist, <laughs> that's their job, is to deal with people with mental illness. That is their, that's the sole purpose of their existence. It, you know, as a job, is to help people with psychiatric disorders. Oh, there you go. So, it's remembering that people aren't going to know and I went on a tangent there I know but they're not necessarily going to know how you well they're not going to know how you feel no one knows how you feel going back to earlier we're the only ones that know how we feel you can tell other people but telling them doesn't even explain to them how you feel because words I don't think words really do justice to emotions Because even though they might feel something inside and they might have huge love for you and respect and they're feeling a degree of pain inside themselves in connection with what you're saying and your energy and your body language and your facial expression and a tone of voice, it's still not going to be the same as what you're experiencing. which means you need to look after yourself as well. And when I say look after yourself, I'm not saying do everything on your own, forget everyone else. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying you need to look after yourself. You need to be kind to yourself. Give yourself a break. Give yourself some time off every day. Make sure that you remember what's meaningful in your life. Because as I said, it doesn't necessarily have to be just one thing. My meaningfulness is very limited. I've only got a couple of things in my life that I care about. Other people might have many things that they really, really care about. Something that they really, that gets them through the day, you know. They might have a yacht or a boat, a fishing boat, or a boat, or uh, a little plane that they put, that they fly, or um, you know, a car that they absolutely love. You know, more than just someone that drives, but they might really love cars, as well as you know, have huge meaning in their family, as well as maybe having a huge amount of meaning in their job that they do, as well as maybe having um, doing voluntary work which has huge meaning for them so I don't think having um, getting in touch with your life's purpose necessarily has to be about one thing I mean my life's purpose is this 
but it's not the only thing that gives me meaning, that gives my life meaning. Andre also gives my life, my life meaning. Having my home gives my life meaning because it's something that I had to wait 44 years for. I had to wait a long time to get this place. And it, even though it's a bit messy and the carpet needs ch changing because of Andre, it gives my life meaning. It really does. But I forget that. I'll be honest with you, I forget it. Sometimes I lie in bed and I think, what is the point? What's the point in getting up? Nothing to get up for. But the fact is there is something to get up for. And then sometimes what I do is I change that thinking from what's the point in getting up to, well, I don't have to get up. Give myself the option. I don't have to make a recording. I'm not getting paid to do this. I'm not, um, I'm not obligated to do anything. I do it because I choose to, because I love it, and because I've, I, I love the idea of helping people. That's why I've been doing it for so long. But I'm not obligated to do it. I don't have to do the washing up. It just means I'll, let, I'll have nothing to eat my food off. So it's a choice don't have to have a bath it just means I'll be stinky and you know he's smelly when, when you've got a ferret and a ferret won't come near you when the ferret starts opening the windows you know you need to have a bath I don't know how he manages to do it but it's very clever sometimes I get up and actually I hear the bath running he's, he's actually run the bath for me <laughs> it's like what it's like you cheeky little monkey so my focus, I think because of Boston Chickie's video, I get, um, I get motivated by, quite often by something that's happened. Something that I might have read, something I might have seen on television, uh, something that I've just thought about, maybe a memory from the past, something that I read on Facebook, someone's profile, uh, a message someone might send me. You know, it's a mix of different things and it triggers, it doesn't trigger, that's probably not the right word, but it stimulates my thinking to a point where I think, ah, oh, okay, I'll talk about this. And I know it doesn't always come out, um, I don't know what the right word is, but it might not all come out in order. You know, I don't rehearse, I'm not reading off a script. That's pretty obvious, I reckon. And things do mix into other things. But that's life, that's reality. You know, I try and cover what comes into my mind when I'm thinking about it. But I also do try and come back as well <laughs> to, the, to the kind of main idea of the recording doesn't always happen but I do try so going back to Boston Chicky we're going back back to first of all her thank you Boston and I just I know a little bit about Boston Chicky and I'm not going to share that on here because she's a friend but I know a little bit about her life as she knows uh, a fair bit about my life as well and from the past I've talked to her and I've made videos online that are no longer available as she has um, when we used to sort of talk about our lives I don't really do that anymore but well I did one the other day so that's not really a good example I did one last night Jason Chats that they're the, the videos that I do every now and then it's like a vlog but I don't do many um, but just to actually hear, to hear someone tell me what you're doing helps people it feels nice. It means more. It just, it means, I don't know, just, it, what it does, it reminds me that I'm not telling myself enough that I've helped other people. I'm not practicing what I'm preaching. And please, I hope I'm not preaching because I don't want to be a preacher, but um, I suppose it can sound a bit preachy sometimes. But some things are fact. 
in my mind, they're fact. And the fact that you have helped people and you deserve to acknowledge that. In fact, the fact is, in my opinion, that you owe it to yourself to acknowledge that you've helped other people. And you do deserve to be happy. And how often do you get told that in life? I've only had one person in my entire life say to me verbally, I'm proud of you, ever. And that was my friend Noel. And that was after doing a, a therapy session with someone, just after I'd started learning hypnosis and NLP. And I told, he let me use his room, one of his rooms in his club. Afterwards, he said, how did it go? I think he was listening outside <laughs> through the keyhole. No, he was <laughs> sure he wasn't. And he said, how did it go? I said, yeah, it seemed to go really well. Um, I told him a little bit about the end results, not why she was there, but that it seemed to go good. And he said, I'm really proud of you. I nearly cried because I've never heard anyone, no one's ever said that to me before. And you know, even, and that was back in, I was a lot younger back then, that's over 20 years ago. So that would be 1990, yeah, 1999. So over 20 years ago that was, and I still remember it. And it meant something. And you know, if it wasn't for him, if it wasn't for Noel, I wouldn't be doing this now. He's the one that kind of steered me towards NLP, which then led me to hypnosis, which then led me to doing this stuff. He's the one that had faith in me. He helped me to get my counselling business going, supported me through that. He was supportive while I was at college. So, and you know, he doesn't realise he's helped people. Again, I don't want to, it's not fair for me to talk about someone else that I know, but, and I've reminded him, and I don't, I'm not even sure if he, if he, if he, if he really believes what I'm saying. I mean, without going into too many details again, he gave me a job as a DJ and it wasn't about money it was basically just after I paid taxis to get home and travel there but it wasn't really any money really involved in a, really in a sense it was just for me it was a social life and it was a, it was it gave me something to do because I just had a big family problem it was a really huge thing that just happened in my family and I told him about it and then he came up and said, do you want a job? Do you want to do this? I said, yeah, all right. Afterwards, he told me he thought I was going to kill myself. That's what he told me. A few years later, not at the time, but he said, he offered me that job because he thought I was going to top myself. He thought I was going to, he really saw that I was so low down. And I was. I, I'm not saying I was going to do that, but I was really, really low on antidepressants, because uh, it was a really, really hard period. And I remind him of that every now and then. And I think sometimes he thinks I'm just saying it for the sake of it. And I'm being ingenuous. Is it ingenuous? But I genuinely appreciate what he did. And I try to, I'm not even saying it in a sense of thanking him. I am, but it's more a case of can you please grasp the fact that you inadvertently, my friend, has helped all these people that I've helped over the years? Even though he's not been the one making the recordings, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be making the recordings. Or I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have started the journey. I may not have ended up making recordings, to be fair, but I did start a journey that helped people. I definitely, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have been a counsellor because the counsellor led on from me doing uh, the hypnosis. 
and volunteering using hypnosis in rehab centres and I started, I fell in love with the counsellors because they were so lovely and I wanted to be like them. Now I wouldn't have gone down that journey if it hadn't been for my friend. So this, and you know, unless you tell them, if, if I hadn't told him that, he wouldn't have connected it, I don't think. He wouldn't have seen it. He wouldn't have seen himself as being important in the process. And he has been. And he still is, as far as I'm concerned, he still is. And he deserves the gratitude from me for as long as I'm alive. And I'm not talking about worshipping at an altar. I'm, I've not got an altar with lots of pictures of him and light candles every day. It's not, it's not like that. It's just, I just recognise the gratitude I have. And I want him to feel that as well. The fact that he has helped people. And we all have. So you deserve to be happy. I don't have to go on, don't I? Go, it's 56 minutes. So this is only going to be a short recording. And I suppose also I'd like to just say thank you to Vicky. I mean, that, that message... Um, 34, 34 years old and haven't had a, a stroke I mean it's I can't I can't imagine it I can't to be that young to be going through that and to know that listening to my my funny voice is helpful means something to me to hear that You know, I had to, years and years and years ago, I'm talking probably about 2009, had a, a message from someone. It was on one of those chat channel things that you used to be able to send messages on. I don't know which one it was, but this young lad sent me a message saying, uh, my mum listened to you for the last six months of her life and it really helped her. Uh, cope with the anxiety and the p physical pain and all that stuff you know with all the treatment and uh, whatever that she was going through I just want to thank you and that was it it's like out of the blue I've no idea who she was I've no idea who he was um, wasn't a friend a Facebook friend or anything like that I was like wow for every person that you know that you've helped or that tell you that you've helped them imagine how many others there are that you're never going to know never going to realise you know, it could be as simple seriously I love, I love this this is what my brain works it could be as simple right as leaving your paper there's only one leaving yeah okay you've got the local paper you leave it on the chair next to you maybe you're sitting at the back of the bus you, you leave the paper on the chair on the seat next to you and you get off the bus the person sitting on the other part of the chair picks up the paper and they read it and they see an advert for a job or they see an advert in the lonely hearts column see you and they wouldn't have seen that otherwise there were no other free papers on the bus it was last thing in the afternoon so they weren't going to see that advert and reading that advert it might not be just an advert but let's say reading the advert for the lonely hearts they might decide, oh, well, I'll contact them and they could end up, you know, being blissfully happy. Having a child who finds a cure for some, you know, disease. And they could just be blissfully happy. It doesn't have to be a child curing diseases, but I'm just saying. Or finding a job that transforms their life 
from being maybe they felt that they were unemployable but actually it turns out that they were and their self-esteem comes back and perhaps they were on the edge you know perhaps they were down to the last 40 pound and they thought you know what I'm going to do I'm just going to drink myself to oblivion but instead of doing that they spend that 40 pound getting their shirt and trousers dry cleaned to go to the job interview that they see in the in the paper and then they get the job and it's a hell of a lot easier to borrow money off people once you've got a job like from family and friends than if you don't have a job I noticed that a few years back I've got a job now dad but I need a bit of help buy food and stuff for the next three weeks okay son <laughs> as long as there's a job as long as there's money coming so you could even go even further they might read an, art, read an article that they would never have read anywhere else about somebody let's say it's a man there reads an article about someone that he likes but no one else generally knows about but it's sort of like a it might be a reality star or maybe a musician from the 70s even someone that he you know really kind of is interested in but and it talks about how they uh, got tested and they they got found that they had prostate cancer and stuff like that and so you need to get tested and all I had was just a and they mentioned a symptom just maybe not connect nor people don't normally have that connection with it and that person reading that's thinking well I forgot that symptom I thought it was just nothing goes to the doctor gets tested and then has whatever treatments needed and lives a long happy life of course you're not responsible for him reading that paper you're not responsible for him taking action on what he reads in that paper but the fact that you left that paper there next to him affected his life And you know, when I think about those situations, I only focus on the positive, the positive examples, the po positive scenarios. So maybe you can think of some in your life. Maybe some of those times in your life that someone else has helped you without realising it. You know, maybe a conversation with someone I'll give you an example of another example for me that I got helped. Someone I worked with in an insurance company, he left and I was still there. And then I left due to illness. This is 2003, November. And then I was working part time in this gift shop and they told me that they wanted me to leave. Basically, they, they wanted me to get a full time job because they couldn't support me because basically it was a Buddhist shop so it's a charity and they they didn't they thought you know they were worried about me and said you need to get a full time job whatever so um, which annoyed me at the time so I'd, I thought I didn't know what to do I applied an insurance company they turned me down I was looking for everything so I'm in Blockbusters and I see my friend that I used to work with at the other place now he was the only person in my office in that, that company that was that was a top salesperson. I was sort of just a little bit below him. But I was good, but he was he was just phenomenal. He was the best. And I was sort of saying, How are you doing? He said, Yeah, I'm working at this place. I said, Oh cool. He, said, he asked me what I was doing. I said, Oh, I'm looking for a job. He said, Well, wait until tomorrow and I'll have had a word with them the managers and I'll get you an interview and I'll put a good word in for you because I know what you like I know that you're good so I said really? and I, d I didn't know if you would or not but I phoned up the next day they said yeah you're, you're Jodie's friend yeah I said yeah they said well come in then come in t this afternoon at three if you want 
came in and they didn't give me the job because of me. They didn't, honestly, they didn't give me the job because of me. They gave me the job because of him, because he was also the top seller there. And they put their trust in him. And I became friends with the manager, you know, a few months into the job. And he told me, he was very, very honest. He said, no, I wasn't going to give you the job. You didn't come across very positive. You weren't dressed particularly well. You, you know, you've been working in a gift shop. It's like you'd left to have a job because you'd been ill. We just didn't really want to give you the job. Didn't think that you'd be any good. But because my friend had put a good word in for me, they gave me the job. And I was terrible at it. No, I wasn't. I wasn't. I was okay. <laughs> I wasn't quite as great as in the other one, but I was okay. The place was full of really good salespeople. So they were very fussy who they took on. But they managed to override that fussiness due to my friend. And me working there led to me going to college and led to me where I am now so my friend changed my life and he's probably not even aware of it guaranteed he's forgotten about it I haven't seen him for a long long time ill forgotten he won't remember that so there might come a time in his life where he's thinking oh never done anything for anyone on the well actually he has done loads for lots of people in fact he got quite a few people jobs there I think over time it saves money doesn't it you know if they don't have to advertise they tried to get their salespeople to you know recommend friends that they knew were good but there you go so That's another boring story done. I I might put that in my Let Me Bore You To Sleep podcast. Which just brings me to just reimburse what I was saying, if that's the correct terminology, probably not. It's not just enough to have a purpose. I mean, you have to have a purpose. You have to have meaning in your life, but that's not enough. You have to remember it. You have to remember. You need to remember the reason, the meaning. It's so important. You need to carry it around like a badge of honour. It needs to be with you. just like someone with a broken leg for six weeks of their life they're not going to forget that their leg's broken any time because of that plaster simply even if the even if the the leg's healed it's not hurting anymore after the first week or so you know it's generally sort of getting better and healing seeing the plaster knowing it's there Never gonna, they can't forget because it's there. And of course, you can't walk around with a, a meaningful plaster, or I suppose, unless you've got a tattoo done or something, to remind yourself of how meaningful your life is and how important you are and how much you've helped other people. So maybe find a way of doing that. Be creative. And also think about, I'm giving you homework now, maybe think about other times when people have helped you and they're not aware of it. Not just to create, you know, to increase your gratitude. It's not for that reason. Although that, I guess that will happen naturally, but not for that reason, but just so you can realise get more in touch with the fact that they're no different to you in a sense of you've also helped others 
you may have helped them and not be aware of it. In fact, I'm pretty sure my friend got paid money after I'd been there for about three months for, empl- for be- me being employed. So he got like £500 or something. I think it's three months or six months because it saved the company so much money advertising that you know anyone that brought in someone, I never bothered because I didn't really know anyone um, that would... I was hanging around Buddhists all the time, so I didn't didn't know anyone would be interested in doing sales. So maybe in his mind, because he got paid for it, because I was there for a couple of years, over two years, maybe he, nearly three years actually, but maybe he in his mind he thought, because he's getting paid for it, it's not helping me, which is completely wrong. because I'd have given him £500 for that job because it did change my life anyway at the time that is <laughs> so I'm going to go thank you for listening I feel like I don't need to say that be remember to be kind to yourself because you deserve to be happy because that's what I've been going on about for the last hour and however long but it's true I suppose I want to get it across that I'm not saying it just for the sake it's not a sound bite it's not just no 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 just saying it it's true it's really true and when you remember that you thought, you thought I was about to end then and I'll start talking again. At least you can press pause and stop it. You don't have to listen. Can you imagine having me as a friend just talking and talking and talking? No, I'm not really like this in real life. I, don't, I do let other people talk a little bit. I do, prefer, <laughs> I do prefer a monologue to a conversation though. Um, yeah, just, just remember... Remember that you do deserve to be happy and remember those things that are important to you, the reason why you do what you do, the things that are meaningful and purposeful. And I will leave it there. I will go. So you take care of yourselves. If you like what I do, leave a review and I will speak to you probably tomorrow or very soon. Lots of love. Bye.